Seattle's considerable momentum came to a crashing halt in Baltimore, as the Ravens dismantled the Seahawks in every aspect of the game. With the loss, Seattle falls back into a tie for first place in the NFC West at 5-3. Joining us to break it down is former NFL quarterback and current Fox College football analyst Brock Heward. Let's light him up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my despondent producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts Podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? Looking better than I'm feeling, man. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a it was a wild weekend of football. Uh, the Seahawks got their asses thoroughly kicked, um, mm-hmm. but... I was blessed to be at the USC Washington game in Man. LA. So that was a barn burner, of course. That was an amazing back and forth between two of the best football players alive. Yes. Uh, in college football, at least. And uh, yeah, it was great. I just wish that the trend of me attending these epic games, followed by the Seahawks getting their asses wrung out, uh, would cease. But, <laughs> yeah. you know. Maybe we've recognized the cosmic trend here. Yeah, we got to keep you from going to these E-Dub games. But, man, you keep getting the good ones. I mean, I know in Seattle for the win over Oregon, in L.A. for the win over USC. I'm glad you got to experience it because uh, not nearly as fun on the pro level. That's right. Well, you know, you've been talking enough shit about the Jacksons prospering mm. uh, on the Seahawks. And so mm-hmm. I just have to maximize my time with Mike's. And let Mike's be who they are and be great. So, you know, the Penix Hive, the Mike Hive, uh, we're up. And <laughs> I'm going to keep riding that wave even if uh, you have your your Jackson-centered fun Fair enough. at the professional level. Yeah, man. You know, I knew the Seahawks had a tall order in Baltimore yesterday, but I did not anticipate them getting absolutely obliterated like that. Now, I can't wait to talk to our guest about whether this is an outlier or if maybe the Seahawks just aren't as good as we were hoping. But before we do that, if you're listening or watching us right now, it's hopefully because you like the show. And if you like the show, there are a few ways you can support it. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, take a couple of seconds to leave us a five-star rating. And if you're feeling super supportive, a quick review as well. You can do that right now. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find full video episodes entertaining clips, and the audio reads of every Cigar Thoughts article after each game this season. Finally, we have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a screaming price as a listener of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm smoking one of them right now. As you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thoughts cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link in the show page to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf, or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll send you the details directly. As we've mentioned before, a box of 10 stogies of this particular blend would normally go for between $350 to $400, but our partnership allows you to get your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of MSRP. And the cigars, they come with a Bevita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. And man, Mike, that was uh, not what I had in mind for the Seahawks-Ravens game. (laughs) (laughs) What was shaping up to be one of the better matchups of the whole season quickly devolved into a one-sided whooping as Baltimore thumped Seattle 37-3 and frankly could have made it worse. It tied the largest margin of defeat of Pete Carroll's career in Seattle, and it forces everyone to reconsider just how good the Seahawks actually are. Luckily for us, we're joined by someone whose perspective we can't wait to get. He was one of the most prolific quarterbacks in University of Washington history before spending six years in the NFL. Now, he's an analyst and commentator for Fox College Football, as well as the host of the Brock and Sock Show on Seattle Sports 710. He is Brock Heward. Brock, thanks for coming in. Well, it's a pleasure. You never know timing-wise how these things work, you know, like we've tried to put this on the books and see which Monday was going to work. And man, there'd have been a whole lot better Mondays in the last <laughs> six weeks, but that's all right. We will, uh, we will dig through the mess that was Baltimore on Sunday afternoon. Sheesh. Yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's you because, uh, you know, like I said, your perspective is one we're really interested in. And 
look, we all saw what happened yesterday. And I think a lot of folks are wondering how a team that had just won five of their last six games could get beaten so soundly one week later. And, you know, it's one thing if you miss some opportunities, but the Seahawks never even came close. And I think as fans, it's easy to be a prisoner of the most recent outcome, which is why I've always preached a bit of a zoomed out philosophy. But that being said, this is a pretty tough one to just wash your hands of. After watching that game, do you feel like what we saw is the type of random outlier result every NFL season has? Or is it indicative that the Seahawks aren't actually ready to compete with the best teams in the league? Well, I think it'd have to be an outlier on the surface. I mean, Pete Carroll in 14 years, I had argued on my show that 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 was the worst loss I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to jump in and do a radio game some years ago and fill in. Yeah, for Warren Moon, and it was the Rams game at home where Todd Gurley just cut him in half. The, the McVay was red hot. I mean, they just blistered him, right? I mean, that was that's what came to my mind watching this the other day. Sure, Pittsburgh in 2011 was 24 nothing shut out. John Schneider famously said said to us that was a game that that he remembered and promised to himself would never happen again. Would never get that physically embarrassed and humiliated on a football field. And th- this one fits in that triumvirate. I mean, they just were it not, does. they weren't competitive and Baltimore was bigger and they were stronger and they were faster. And, you know, on one end of it, it at least in some of these games, maybe an offense is doing their thing, but your defense gets killed or the defense hangs in there and the offense can- can't get started. You had six first downs offensively and you gave up nearly 300 yards rushing. So both of them were culprits. Both of them couldn't compete. And the biggest problem, and the Detroit Lions realized this, and that would probably be further evidence as to how this can be an anomaly or an outlier to your question, is, hey, man, you fall behind to those guys and the numbers that Baltimore, from an efficiency standpoint, are putting up, Baltimore, from a, from a defensive metric standpoint, are putting up, all the next-level numbers tell you that if you play from behind against them in their building, you're playing uphill in a way that very few teams in this league are built to compete with. Yeah, that's exactly right. They they remind me of the 49ers a lot that way. And that if, if you get behind by two scores and all of a sudden you don't have your full playbook available to you anymore, yep. this team just pins its ears back. And, and we can't overlook how good this Ravens team is. I'm glad you mentioned it. I was reading this morning that they are now the third highest DVOA of all time through nine weeks. So, I mean, this is not just a good team. This might be an elite team, even among some of the good teams of the most recent years. And, you know, you mentioned only six first downs on offense. They also gave up 300 yards rushing. I know it's officially 298, but they downed out the last three yards. You know what I mean? Like, what's the main takeaway from this? Obviously, you mentioned they were out physical, but it feels like there was more to it than that. Yeah, I, it was, you know, and along those lines, they get to those numbers. What do you say? Third best DVOA that we have seen yep. by beating the Detroit Lions when they were red hot going in there with just one loss and wondering, ooh, this Detroit team is real. Oh, yep. nope, they just get absolutely hammered. These Seahawks have won five of six, go in there. Nope, they get absolutely hammered. Um, they When Lamar Jackson's healthy, that, you know, when, when he is feeling good and right now he's playing with extreme confidence. Yes, he is. I think that new coordinator, Munkin, I loved him at Georgia. I thought he was innovative and creative. They've put a few more people, a flowers around him with his kind of speed and OBJ. And you just feel kind of the confidence of that whole crew. But when Lamar is going, he's as good as there is. And, and defensively, I don't know. I mean, Burrow, Holmes, there's others that are brutally difficult to try to stop. But he does it with his legs. He does it at times with his arm. He does it just elevating the confidence level of everybody around him. So it was a, you know, in the NBA, they say there's just sometimes brutal matchups or in yeah. March Madness when you are picking teams in your tournament trying to figure out, okay, well, this is a matchup. This is an unfavorable matchup. This, these two teams just don't match up. You know, I think many fans thought physically – speed and strength and size the Seahawks could match up but they got a lesson learned that nope and especially if you fall behind to become one-dimensional you can get embarrassed and they were embarrassed in Baltimore over the weekend look when when your O-line isn't blocking it's tough to you know make too strong judgments elsewhere but you know I I like Shane Waldron I felt like he got completely outclassed by Mike McDonald in this game. It didn't feel like there was a counterpunch available to what they were doing. And and like Mike and I were talking before the show started, Baltimore's defense, it's not just, hey, line up and we've got a bunch of good players. I mean, the amount of responsibilities that every player on that defense has from linemen to linebackers to safeties. I mean, all (laughs) they all play at all three levels and it makes it really difficult to understand or to anticipate what's coming next. 
But Seattle didn't have an answer. No. No, they didn't. And, you know, Pete kept pointing to it both post game and in our show this morning saying, golly, the biggest turning point was at 14 3. You mm-hmm. get the second takeaway of that first half, and you have to have takeaways against them. And they did. They took the ball away a couple times there, a couple fumbles, and then you don't capitalize and you get sacked. And then a sack fumble that gives them the ball. They score, they double up on you, and it was good night, Irene. There is something to that. They've been able to kick a field goal. They've been able to, who knows, hit a big play down the field and just threaten them. Just mm-hmm. put some level of fear. Momentum's a tricky word. Some hate, some people hate it. Some people love it. Some people rely too much on it. You know, many times I just look at dic- who's dictating to whom. That, mm-hmm. that, that to me is like momentum. Like, am I dictating? Am I setting the tone to your point with Shane Waldron? Or am I the one that is just in total respond mode and hang on mode? And they were put in a hole. There was very little creativity. Um, I thought from the jump, I want to see against their defense that does so much. I want to see Gino on the move. I want to see Gino in play action. I want to see Gino in creative situations. I don't want him between the tackles trying to decipher and read a very exotic defense that does as much as anybody in the league. And yep. they did. And they just kind of put him right there between the tackles, isolated, put the O-line in a burden, and just had – this is – you know, I <laughs> – and maybe it's too critical, but it feels like in some of their games where they just go dormant, it feels like their creativity goes dormant. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to see the other. When things are starting to stall, pick up your tempo. Get to some unique stuff. Get to some jet sweeps. Get to some screens. Get to something that will you know, force the issue and, and dictate a little bit to the defense other than you just having to respond to their overwhelming presence. Yeah, and if nothing else, fail differently, you know? <laughs> Just getting the three tight ends a little bit. Pete said they had more plays, that that was going to be available to them. I don't know. Yeah, just kind of that the numbers on Geno, kind of like Drew Locke, this is where they are very similar. If you look at their play action versus their drop back, it is an enormous difference in splits. Mm -hmm. And I don't have full context context to know if that's league-wide with every quarterback. I'm going to guess most QBs do like and do thrive in play action, but mm-hmm. the disparity for, for Locke is off the charts. And the disparity for Geno is fairly real as well. I think he's excellent in play action. I think he's a great ball handler. I think when he you know is able to, um, and you're able to, again, dictate an impact through that play action and just you know narrow the windows and, and narrow the thought process better for Geno. When he's got to try to be just a straight drop back guy, kind of like Russell in that way, I don't think you're playing to his strengths. You know, I think the thing that we're all overlooking and what Shane Waldron and Gino were overlooking is the monumental power of a Jadevian Clowney revenge game. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And wasn't it kind of weird to see him in 24 as well? You know, looking slim, yes. the new number, all of it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Totally. Yeah, and, I, and I thought that that was, you know, they didn't, they talked about it a little bit, but I think I probably, if I was doing the game, would have focused on that a little bit more. You're right. I mean, he, there's a little, I mean, he's been on enough teams that he's, you know, going to be motivated against just about everybody <laughs> in the league. But what I, what jumped out to me is you get to this stage of your career. And I, I saw this with a lot of veteran guys, you realize what you are and what you're not. And he's, he's, he stopped pretending to be, try to be a 265 pound guy. And you know what? Let me be 235. And my yeah. knee feels better. My joints probably feel better. I'm not trying to carry any extra weight. And if I give a little bit with maybe the pure power at the point of attack, well, what it gives me is that quickness and that length and that agility. And uh, man, he is, and that whole team is equipped and built in a pretty dominant, beautiful way at every level. Yeah. You know, Brock, I'm glad you mentioned the play action splits because. Yeah, league wide, there there is a big jump. You know, kind of begs the question: Why not build the whole plane out of play action offense? But you know, we're we're not seeing enough of it. I don't think right now, and we do mm-hmm. need that creativity. But zooming in on the quarterback, the conversation around Geno Smith has gotten progressively louder as the season yep. has worn on. And yesterday definitely turned the volume up on that discourse. And what may have been the worst statistical game of his career, at least with Seattle. I mean, he went 13 of 28, 157 yards, no touchdowns, turned it over twice, lost 34 yards on sacks. And granted, he was being harassed and harangued all afternoon because Seattle's O-line was completely overmatched. But you've stood back there in NFL pockets. You know what it's like to try and operate in that chaos. How much of yesterday's performance was poor play from Geno? And how much of it were circumstances that most, if not all, NFL QBs would have struggled in? 
I think the majority would have struggled when you fall behind on the road in that building against that crew, whose again, numbers are just absolutely off the charts. You know, it didn't help that Jackson dropped the first third down of the game and third yeah. downs have been the biggest challenge for this offense. And for Gino, both this season, the second half of last year, something that's got to be adjusted and answered if they're going to, you know, be a, a legit playoff contender and make some noise and not just simply get in, but you bobble the first third down. And that was a bummer. I believe the next drive or maybe the drive after that, there's a third down Tyler's open it's going to be a conversion ball gets tipped off the field another third down ball gets tipped it's off the mm-hmm. field and and those are just the problems and, and the challenges there's a miscommunication uh, between the signals getting out to Tyler and and he didn't get the signals and ultimately sure that falls on Gino but the other people that also got to get those signals communicated and get that done so you do not put the ball in harm's way um, nine touchdowns to seven interceptions isn't going to cut it bottom line mm-hmm. period end of story last year he threw 30 I thought he was more creative at times, extending plays with his legs. He was a difference maker for them a bunch. And that's what the fans see. I mean, that those are the easy numbers to just go, wow, nine touchdowns, seven interceptions, now a fumble. So mm-hmm. nine touchdowns, eight turnovers. That's just mm-hmm. not, that is just not going, not going to cut it. And now thankfully you play a Washington team that's still good on defense not as elite as they were with their pass rushers. You play a Rams team that's still good on defense, but certainly not you know, what they were um, and have been in the past. These are get right, and he's got to get right. This offense got to get right. The rhythm's got to get right. The confidence has got to get right, or the noise around that position is going to continue to build and build and build. Do you see a different quarterback when you watch Geno Smith this year versus last year? I see a different one the last two weeks. I don't know yeah. if I see saw one different through the first you know five or six games, but the last two weeks I did. I saw mm-hmm. a guy that against Cleveland there were probably six or seven throws, Jackson. Where I was like, that just doesn't that doesn't look like Gino. Like what, what was that? I you know, know, he doesn't miss a throw like that. He doesn't he doesn't throw these you know screwball cutters into the ground. Like I've seen guys like dirt balls. He's not usually one. He's usually pretty, and his ball is usually very tight spiral. You know, and it's not perfect. No, no QB is, but he's a clean, pure deliverer of the football. Yes. And it started a little bit in that Cleveland game, like oh, 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 a little bit like, of the yips, man. I mean, yes, he's, I don't he's like five or six some. of these throws and totally. Yeah, and Pete, you know, Pete's side of it, and there is some merit to it, was when you preach all week, get the ball out. Get the ball out. Throw it early. Throw it on time. You know, that I just think his speed and timing mechanism was a little a little afoul against Cleveland. It, although, in the final drive, he was clean and pure and threw five of his best balls, or four of them, of the entire game when it mattered the most, and he get the win. And then you go to Baltimore, and yes, there the pocket was squeezed inside or outside. It was pressured inside. They were tight windows. There was pressure. He's getting bumped. But it's just not, you know, that ball's coming out of his hand just kind of funky. I don't think he's hurt. I don't think any of that. Right. But he, his clock and his mechanism and his timing for a guy that is usually as pure as it comes when he's on rhythm, it has not been as pure the last couple of weeks for sure. Yeah, yeah. Are DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett doing enough to help him out? I mean, obviously their production is way down this year. Is that something specifically with them that's concerning, whether it be, you know, DK's polish, Tyler's age, or is it just a result of how much pressure the passing game has been under this season? Yeah, I think that that, um, I think they're different. I, I would probably say Tyler to me looks like Tyler. I know he's fought a little bit of injury and missed some practice time, but you know, he seemingly still gets open a lot, was open yep. in this game, you know, did catch some some nice some nice passes on time. When things broke down, Gino could not get it to him. You know, a number of plays. He could have easily had seven, eight, nine catches in this game. Mm-hmm. I think you're trying to feed a lot of mouse. You know, are yeah. we an 11 personnel team? Are we a 12 personnel? Are we a 13 personnel? What about our backs? And what about getting Charbonnet involved with Ken Walker? You know, like this is one of the blessings and curses. You get, you now have a bunch of guys that can play. And Jackson Smith and Jigba the last two weeks has looked like the dude I wanted yeah. to see. Quickness yeah. and speed and urgency and playmaking ability. And yeah, okay, now he's starting to fit. So you want to get him involved. You want to get your tight ends involved. You want to get your running backs involved. You want to get totally. Tyler and DK involved. But that, what was it, 5 for 14 uh, to DK against Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was bad. I love the 14 part of that. Love the 14 part I of that. I do, but you've got to, you got to connect and 
you can't be one hopping stuff. And, you know, DK can't be, you know, when he's got an end zone fade, you can't be pushed to the boundary. You can't let no. that 12th defender mm -mm. squeeze you. You've got to use your big old frame. And if anything, you know, create more room and space so you can get that ball to you. So, yeah, I think that's a really underrated part of this year's offense versus previous iterations, because for as long as Pete Carroll's been here, it doesn't matter who the offensive coordinator is. The targets have been siloed to two guys. Yep. A lot, you know, I mean, yep. every year you've got close to a 50% target share between their top two uh, receivers, whether that was when, when Baldwin was here, um, obviously Lockett and now, and now DK and yeah, they've got the tight ends who are worthy of getting targets and yep. have shown that they can move the chains and get long plays. Obviously you're working Jackson Smith and Jigba in there and that's a new wrinkle, but on the other side of the ball, we saw a defense that had been, I mean, in just about every statistical category, top two, top three in the NFL over the last month. And that just got blown up completely. Yeah. I mean, you see, you see those videos where they have the, the mascots play football against the little kids. You seen those? Yes. Yeah. That's what it looked like watching the Seahawks try to tra tackle the Ravens yesterday. It did. And the bummer for them is the first two opening drives, it didn't, right? I mean, the first nope. two, the opening drive of the game, and then they back them up with the punt, and you get a three and out, and you get the ball back, and you just – you didn't play any complimentary football. And then the longer they stayed on the field, you could start to see Lamar go, okay, all right, time for me to, you know, and, and he does that. And if you watch a lot of Lamar over the years, like he does a little bit of the Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson back in the day, a little bit of the rope of dope, like, okay, mm -hmm. we'll keep this game going. And then when I need to, and I need to step on maybe a little bit of risk or take a little more aggression or put my body in harm's way. Okay, now I'll do it. And they started that in the second quarter. Is it kind of slug back and first back and forth through the first? Then it was, all right, time for me to, you know, scramble, time for me to keep it on the zone read, time for me to to go run, and then I can compliment my back. So now that you're gonna be thinking about me running, and here goes Gus. And so now you're gonna be thinking about me running, and here comes, you know, Mark Andrews. So yeah, they uh, if you don't play complimentary ball and you don't put pressure on them and you don't make him one dimensional as a pocket passer between the tackles, you are in when he's healthy for a long afternoon. And he has shown that year yeah. after year after year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's likely that the true talent of this defense lies somewhere between how good they've been recently and how bad they were yesterday. But do you think that they're closer to being the lockdown unit we saw all October or to the team that got absolutely housed by a very good offense yesterday? Yeah, I think they're going to end up in between. You know, October, it was awfully nice to play P.J. Walker and Josh Dobbs with Arizona and, you know, face some yep. some backup quarterbacks when you're going to now face, you know, Dak Prescott and Jalen Hurts and Brock Purdy twice. And and we'll see if Stafford, my guess is Stafford's probably going to roll back in there just in time. Who knows? Kyler Murray may be back at the end of the year, yeah. too. So <laughs> yep. your timing may be horrific in that case to to face the legitimate franchise kind of dudes. You're, they're going to make you look a little bit, a little more normal. I think this crew can play a whole lot better than they did. A lot, lot better. Their tackling was atrocious. Um, they did definitely wear down. The loss of Uchenna Nuosu is real. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that Clint Hurt wore on the throwback jersey day Uchenna's jersey to the stadium because that guy is an absolute pro, set an edge, difference maker in the run game. Frank has looked a little bit like, okay, now that's why Frank was on the market, you know, yep. um, out there because I'm not, I'm not seeing it maybe in some time and comfort and everything else. He makes a few more plays. This Derek Hall injury to his shoulder is concerning to me. It's yeah. bothered him. It get banged up again. I wouldn't be surprised if he may have to miss a little bit of time. And Daryl Taylor is just not a point of attack guy. I mean, we saw that last year in their bare front. People would run at him, and they would blow him off the ball and wear him down. So, yeah, it's uh, going to get a little more difficult, you know, and, and we know that in this league, attrition is real, especially on defenses late in the year and into the playoffs. So, um, but, but all that being said, they're still at the second and third level deeper than they've ever been. I yes. love Spoon. Um, Jamal is hit or miss to me at times. Mm -hmm. Jordan Brooks is – playing some of the best ball of his career. So yes, he is. they're still going to play good defense. Is it going to be what it was in October? Is it going to be elite elite? Are they going to hold people to 3.2 yards of carry? Probably not with the gauntlet they still got coming. How valuable has Boye Mafe been, especially now that Nwosu is, awesome. is down? I mean, six straight games with a sack awesome. is wild. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and it kind of reminds me for a lot of years, Jackson, we talk about QBs coming out of school, and if you're not naturally accurate, can you grow in accuracy mm. like a pitcher? You know, if there's mm -hmm. some that just have natural command 
And can you teach command and can you grow command? And I would say like the Josh Allens of the world, it's been a hiccup this year, but you know, we have seen some Jalen Hurts coming out of Oklahoma. That was a real question. Yep. Can he have accuracy consistently in command and command and all of that? Um, Jalen is, is silent some of that. And, you know, I, I think Josh Allen has to a degree as well. And, you know, just that command. And, and for me, then defensive players, it's instincts. When mm-hmm. I hear scouts say, ah, the instinct meter is a little slow. It's a quarterback's command. It's a defensive instincts. And that was a question with Boye. It was, certainly wasn't the physical. I mean, he's a freak right. show, 4'5", 260 pounds, absolutely shredded, you know, boulders for shoulders. He, he Off the bus, he's exactly what you want. Yeah. But are the instincts there? And we have seen those instincts ramp up tremendously and maybe even better than any of us on the outside thought that they could be. And he's mm-hmm. becoming, as you heard Romo yesterday, man, one of these dudes that just is playing at a speed different than so many of his peers. Well, it's been so long since Seattle's had someone on the defensive line that other teams actually have to game plan for. Yep. And I think Mafe is getting to that point. And if he gets to the point where teams are putting an extra blocker or even an extra half blocker just to keep him out of the backfield, it does create opportunities elsewhere. And I think that's the part that gets me yep. excited. Yeah, and that's where you go out and get Leonard Williams, you know, and they wanted him for quite some time and try to get him in the offseason at the draft and everything else. Because if he's doing that, then Jaron Reed and Leonard Williams and Dre Jones, and then all of a sudden those guys can come to life a little bit more. Jordan Brooks and his blitzing and doing what he's more than capable of doing, Bobby at times. So, yeah, um, but they're going to need Daryl to – Daryl's got to be better. Yeah, He, he just was – overwhelmed if there were a few guys yesterday to me on the Seahawks defense that were overwhelmed it was him and I would say what's going to be a growing narrative if uh, Rick Woolen were a quarterback Mm -hmm. there would be a lot of noise around his game right now Mm -hmm. because I am not seeing the physical presence that we saw at times a year ago Um, it feels to me just whether it's confidence whether it was that injury that knocked out most of of the offseason and it's training camp for him I'm not seeing him just just letting it go. I'm not, I'm seeing a guy that's hesitant a little bit and yep. you know, he's, just, he's not playing as well as he did his rookie year and that can happen. Sophomore slumps. Pete hates that term, but sophomore slumps yeah. can be real, especially yeah. when you come out of nowhere as he did his rookie year and played out of his mind at a level. No one in all the NFL expected, but that dude's got to pick it up because his physical in this defense, you got to support and Witherspoon is more than capable and has shown that, um, Reek has got to be, he's got to be better on that other side. Yeah, man. I mean, it's wild given how good he was last year. It has been wild to see teams pick on him these yep. last two weeks. Like they yep. are looking his way. And, and part of that is a credit to how good Witherspoon has been, whether he's been inside or outside. Trey Brown is playing his ass off right he now, is. you know? And so part of that is it's going to be funneling. But if you told me before the season, the other two corners were going to be so good that teams would be funneling targets towards Zarek Woolen. I said, bring it on. Let's go. But yep. but that has been a soft spot. The last thing I want to touch on with you about this game before we just kind of rinse it out and move on is the discipline of this team. They came into the game, the most penalized team in the NFL. You can't do that against Baltimore. It probably wasn't going to matter yesterday mm-hmm. anyway. But man, that fourth and one when Draymond jumped off sides, just little stuff like that, that yep. when they get ready for that gauntlet, where it's 49ers twice, the Cowboys and the Eagles, you you cannot do that against those teams. No, no, that is one though, that <laughs> I'm just not going to fight that fight, man. We, we've seen so <laughs> many of Pete's teams. Like that's to me, it's like true, man. my father-in-law loves to say life's about trade-offs, you know, like mm-hmm. that that's going to be the trade-off when you yep. got a player empowerment coach when you got a guy that just loves them protects them builds them up he's preaching it sure he's got his board of penalties dk was pretty clear what he thought of that um <laughs> and that made certainly a lot of headlines sure i i don't know man they're never going to be a top 10 least no. penalized team they're just not no. so you're yeah. gonna have to live with some of those trade-offs no i think the juice is probably worth the squeeze you know yes. he wants those guys playing on the edge and that's that's going to come that's going to come with it i think that's totally fair looking ahead the seahawks do have a chance though to kind of you said it earlier to get right you know the nice thing about a game like this is that there's always next week yeah and seattle gets the other beltway team this sunday when they face washington commanders in seattle i want to you know get your thoughts on that matchup specifically but first how does the team go about flushing a performance like this one? And how confident are you and Pete Carroll and his staff in getting these guys to put it behind them? Yeah, I'm pretty confident in the latter. He he has shown that and just the way they go about their whole process and his language and all of that. I, I don't 
don't think that that's going to carry over. And I would frankly argue just from, I guess, my own personal life experience and being around teams that that game is easier to flush when you get on that long flight. And it was a long flight, yeah. five plus hours home from Baltimore, six or whatever. It's, you know, easier when you just get to hand it to you. Like there's no excuse. There's no finger pointing. There's no blame. Like we all got absolutely crushed mm -hmm. and those can be. And I asked Pete, you know, very specifically that question, Jackson, on our Monday morning show, just saying, are you a believer that there's times that, you know, you get humbled and you get beat, that that can be good? And he did not diminish that. Absolutely. There's a standard. Baltimore just showed you, you know, like when you go golf with a really great golfer and you then realize like what you are and what you're not <laughs> and, and you eat <laughs> yeah. some of that humble pie, like, oh, okay. So Jackson that's understands that one well. Like. Jackson, <laughs> Jackson's, Jackson's been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand that better than I wish I did. That's Isn't it a little bit easier when you play with a scratch and you go like, okay, yeah, yeah I do suck. I'm not that good, you know, or <laughs> yeah. these are the areas that I need to get so much better at if I'm actually ever going to be good. And for the team, like you leave that game, you, you're built to be like them. You're built totally. to run the ball. You're built to win the line scrimmage. You're built to bully people, and you're built to to, to break people's will. And yep. Baltimore just did it to you. That's the standard that we have got to play at or try to reach over the course of the rest of the season. Yeah, and I think there's value in coming face to face with the standard. And right yep. now, Baltimore is the standard. Yep. But looking forward, you have a very different team this weekend. The Commanders have been sort of wild this year. They're four and five. They have a handful of close wins against some pretty poor teams. But by the same token. They've given the eight and one Philadelphia Eagles everything they could handle twice. Yep. yep. They've got this young high variance quarterback and Sam Howell, a couple of really talented receivers, but they also just shipped off their two best defenders at the deadline. How good do you think this commander's team is? And Brock, is there a chance for the Seahawks to like, just go out and put it on them the way that they had it put on them mm. this past weekend? Uh, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. I feel like there's enough new m young moving parts for the Seahawks that that's not going to happen, that Baltimore was such a fully bloomed culture, right? You looked at yeah. that roster. If you put together a team, you're like, okay, how do I want them to look? How do I want to build this? Where do I want experience? Like they didn't have, I know Zay Flowers plays for them, but man, they mm -hmm. have developed Queen and they've developed their guys. They went out and got, you know, Clowney and some veteran guys. They, they just are, are fully fully developed. I don't feel like with the with all of the youth that's playing in this rookie class and last year's rookie class to think you could put on that kind of lesson. I I don't know if I see that coming, but certainly, you know, this is not a team in Washington that, that is equipped like Baltimore in any way. You are playing back at home. Um you should be fairly healthy. We'll see coming out of that game there are a few nicks and bumps as I mentioned Derek mm -hmm. Hall. That's yeah. real because you've lost to Chenna. Um, but they're dangerous, man. They got some dudes that can run. The enemy, you know, is going to try to get them in space. The enemy has played the Seahawks a few different times as a coordinator and had some success against them. So they've got some some dangerous speed playmakers. Howell can run around. He will create. He's not Lamar by any means, but he's a guy that is nifty, that is creative, that can extend plays. So um, and you know, yeah, you lose your two best players, but all that means is those next two stepping up yep. get the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, and you see, you know, like the Denver Broncos, they ship out. Randy Gregory and get rid of Frank Clark and their young guys are playing much better than Frank yeah. and Randy ever did in Denver. So that can be a dangerous card and has been against the Seahawks in the past with some of these teams and, and names you don't know, or players that are, you're unfamiliar with, but they get their chance and they go out. Oh, I don't know. Like the Rams did in the opening week with, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that receiver from, Oh, where was he? BYU. BYU, uh, Puka Nakua. Yeah, there you go. Husky Puka legend. one time Come Husky, on yep. Um, and he all of a sudden, he just puts on an absolute show. So, no, it'll probably be a dog fight. That's usually how most of them are with the Seahawks. But uh, they do um, not present in any way what Cleveland and Baltimore has in their front seven in a way that you should not be able to be balanced, should not be able to handle. And hopefully, Jackson, and most importantly, get back to running the freaking ball. Thank you. I was just about people. to say yes. that. Push them off the ball. Set up your play action game. That's who you want to be. That's who you've drafted. That's who you're equipped to be. You got big old guys. They miss Bradford. They need Bradford. He's a mm -hmm. difference maker for blowing people off the ball, but they got to get back to doing that first and foremost. You know, one thing that's been interesting to me this year, and I'm glad you mentioned the run game because that's what I was going to bring up next. Last year, Seattle had the highest explosive run rate in the NFL between Rashad Penny early in the year, Ken Walker the rest of the way. They had trouble in short yardage running, but they were hitting home runs almost yep. every week, and they haven't done that yep. this nope. year. Is that just something? I mean, plays like that, 70-yard touchdown runs, those are outlier plays, but it can be a part of your DNA 
to hit those and Seattle's not hitting those. Is this just another variance thing or is there something about this run game that is not creating the space for them to get these runs that are bigger than 10, 12 yards? Yes and yes. I, I think you've got to, you know, running begets running. You've got to continue to just run it. And I know they tried to do that. And here's a first down run, second down, third and manageable, uh, you know, and there's a pass and you're off the field. So in, in that game, as I said, just totally got away from them. Um, you did play two of the most elite front sevens. I mean, you yeah. talk about standard in Cleveland and Baltimore, just those front yes. sevens with the humanoids that you try to move, you try to create space against. Cincinnati, be, no slouch the week before. Uh, no, or two weeks bad. before. The whole AFC North is just, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, they got some absolute monsters in there. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but to me, there is some creative creativity that's got to come. There's some threat of jet sweep. There's some, you know, some misdirection. I think there's some flip nine. There's got to be, I think there's some things that, that, you know, Shane Waldron can do to, to help some of that, to help the guys up front. Um, you know, let's face it. We got, you know, we talked earlier about the passing game and a lot of mouths to feed. Now you got Ken and Charbonnet too. I'd like to yep. see a little more Charbonnet. I think he's got a different style, but you got to get enough snaps. You got to get enough first downs. You got to get enough plays so you can get everybody involved. I think in the way that they envision that they're possible, you know, that possibility right. here down the road. And, and running backs have to get in rhythm too. They got to yes, be able to feel the game. And you're right. If you're getting, if you're, if you're alternating, let's just say you're alternating drives with, you know, the other running back in, in the backfield and you get one carry or two carries because you're not getting first downs and you're back off the field. How are yep. you supposed to get a feel for the game? Yep. It's uh it is a whole, it is a whole lot harder. So we've not really seen that. You're right. Is, is you bring up that explosive run element. We've seen a 30, we've seen a 40, we've seen Ken get out a couple times, but we have just not seen the consistency of run game. And honestly, the 49ers twice, Dallas, Philadelphia, if you become one dimensional, like you, you did, yeah. you know, last weekend, this last weekend, if you did for two and a half quarters against Cleveland, you're just not, you're just not going to, not going to cut it. You know, Gino just doesn't create enough with his legs and do all that stuff and, and, you know, to offset some of it. But even then, even the greats in the game, the Mahomes, and you're seeing it this year too. I mean, oh, yeah. he needs some of the people around him. He needs some of the balance around him. Yeah. If these Seahawks are going to be, I think what they are capable of, and that's being better than they were a year ago. And last year they were a nine win team. This can be a 10, maybe an 11, maybe it you know, feels maybe, you know, closer to a 10 win team, but get in the playoffs with the right matchup and uh, firing at the right cylinders at the right time with this youth development, they got a chance to make some noise, but it doesn't happen unless you're balanced offensively. Yeah, totally. And, and look, I know that you, have a very, very busy day and really, really appreciate your time. I want to get your thoughts on one last thing. Yeah. Because, you know, one thing that, that the Seahawks haven't done, and it goes back to what we were talking about with the expo explosive runs, they're not stealing touchdowns anymore, right? Like mm. once in a while, you just need to be able to score without having to convert four first downs to yep. do it. That's just a really difficult way to score points. And Seattle, for the most part, has gotten away with being able to do that. But even after getting stomped the way that they did yesterday, the Seahawks are still five and three. They are still tied for first place in the NFC West. I know that feels crazy after yep. yesterday's game. So when you step back, and, and you hinted at this just now, but when you step back and look at everything we've seen from the team so far this season, how good do you think they really are? And how big is the gap, if any, between them and the true contenders in this league? Well, yeah, it's kind of like Jerry DePoto loves to say um, with the Mariners, and that is, hey, there's a lot of people that would trade their situation, their organizational situation for ours. Yep. They would trade their roster and roster construction for ours. And that is, I think, what I'm most excited about. These two rookie classes – have some yeah. have some just difference makers, some generational mm -hmm. kind of dudes. Spoon is he's just different to be coming out and doing what he's doing. Um, you know, Charbonnet and Bobo and Ken Walker and and Derek Hall and Boye Mafe. Like I, I think most teams and organizations around the league would look at what John's drafted the last two years and go, Man, oh yeah. I, I really like a lot of components of that. Now, are there some other areas that got to figure out and some, some of the veterans, you know, and a Bobby and a Jamal, how much more do they have, you know, realistically for years to come? Sure. There's those questions. And, and DK is kind of a wild card in this. Mm -hmm. um, and because you see stretches of brilliance and you see some valleys of, of real frustration, but by and large, Jackson thrilled about where in the foundational youth and young pieces they have. And, you know, I, I love the speed. I think this is as fast a team as we have seen, especially mm -hmm. defensively. So uh, super excited on where the arrow is going. But the details, some of the veterans, some of the play calling, some of the ups and the downs over the course yeah. of the season, got to weather it and got to do it against some of the best here over the next six, seven weeks. 
yeah, you know, I said in the article yesterday, I, I came in to this season feeling like this was a 10 win team, true talent, 10 win team with, I would assume, you know, favored in the first round matchup against, you know, a bad NFC South winner or something like that. And yesterday's result doesn't really scare me off of 10 wins or even a playoff win. What it does is dampen the enthusiasm that was building that maybe this team is a lot more than that. You win five out of six, you start to feel we can beat anybody. Maybe we can go into Philadelphia and win a game. Maybe we can split with the 49ers and win this division. And I think that's still very much within their range of outcomes, but sobering yesterday to see Okay, if you don't have it, if all those things that you just mentioned aren't clicking, you're not just good enough to line up and beat those guys. No, I think that is, uh, I think that's very fair. I think that's very well said. And I think it'll be incumbent on both some of those young guys and Gino and Tyler to say, all right, you know, this is the standard and we just saw it and we didn't meet it, but here's how we got to close the gap. And unlike your golf game and unlike my golf game, (laughs) there's no way for you and I to do that. Um, But there is a way for those guys to do it because if Gino could play to his ceiling, if he can get back into rhythm, Mm -hmm. if he can gain, if there is a little bit of a a bust in some confidence and some of the timing and some of those elements and just start to be like, okay, yeah, that's right. That first quarter against Cleveland, that's as good as any, anybody could ever play the position. Now, yes. now do that. Get back. Play with that kind of rhythm. Play with that kind of swag. Play with that kind of, you know, that kind of game. He's going to be a big focal point, man. That conversation with the way his contract is structured too is not going away. Is not going anywhere. I love how he handles it. I love his leadership. So does Pete. But he's got to be the first one there to just, you know, play at a consistent level that he is capable of doing. And this team, with its youth and with a few other holes, desperately needs him to do. Yeah, man. Fully agree. Brock, listen, man, this has been a blast. I I really, really appreciate the work that you and Mike do on your show, but I'm especially grateful for it on Monday mornings, especially after a bad loss. Appreciate your perspective. Super grateful for your time today. If we do it again, let's try to do this after a win. I'll talk to the Seahawks. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. That, that's on me. That's okay, on me. You. I'll do a All better right. job of scheduling <laughs> out with, uh, I'll get, I'll get together with Pete. Hey, listen, uh, before you get out of here, most of the people listening are familiar with you and your work, but for those who might not be, where can they get more of you? Oh, Twitter's always a fun place. You know, I still wait in those waters every <laughs> once in a while. I brought Brock Ewer there. And then, yep, doing the Fox College football. I actually have the Huskies and Utes this Saturday, mm. which I can't wait to to be around the program a, yeah. a bunch over the course of the week. That should be a great game. And, um, yep, Salk and I every single morning over there at Seattle Sports. Um, 7 to 10 for me, 6 to 10 for the show. And uh, certainly certainly enjoy the fans. And, and they make a radio show go, man, just as you know, in this capacity, in this medium yeah. as well. It's about the listeners and – Super appreciate those for now. Almost 15 years of doing radio in Seattle. It's crazy, man. That's amazing. All right, guys, you've got your marching orders. You know where to find them, and uh, we'll be looking for you when the Huskies play the Utes this weekend. Appreciate it. Thanks, bud. All right, friends, that's going to do it for today. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at at Jackson Bevins. That's J-A-C-S-O-N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts, and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article after each game at FieldGoals.com slash Cigar Thoughts. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Finally, be sure to check out CigarThoughtsNFL.com to get your exclusive Cigar Thoughts cigars. Or hit me up on Twitter and I'll shoot you the deets. And when you buy them, reach out, tell us what you think. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of this show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making it happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. <laughs>